Absolutely. Thank you. Hi. So it's a great pleasure to be here. It's incredibly special for me. Uh, so many thanks to the organizers, Asim and Teet, for this lovely workshop. So many wonderful things have been said about my dad over the last one and a half days. So what I will say here is just to basically highlight one of the aspects which has already been alluded to, which has influenced me personally a lot in my research career, which is his incredible breadth of knowledge in almost all areas of physics and astrophysics. This is one thing which he inculcated in me right from the start of my research career. And I actually started out working on quite theoretical areas, electromagnetism, general relativity, and so on. And then I found cosmology very interesting, so worked a little bit on the cosmic microwave background and weak lensing. Uh, of late, I have been very much interested in much more observational, data-driven kind of science, which is intergalactic medium reionization, and, what I'm, and also a lot about the neutral hydrogen in the post-reionization phase of the universe, so between redshift of, say, 6 to 0. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is based on a few pieces of work which I've been involved in with these people over the last three or so years in these references on how we can develop and constrain a halo model framework for the distribution and evolution of neutral hydrogen, H1, over the post-reionization phase of the universe. So just to give you a little bit of introduction, this is something which Thiet alluded to a little bit in his talk. And it's probably fair to say that we are now approaching a golden age of cosmology with the red-shifted 21-centimeter line of neutral hydrogen. So this 21-centimeter cosmology is special because unlike having just one surface, as you tune in different frequencies, you're actually accessing different redshifts. At each redshift, you're accessing a surface. And so together, you have a unique three-dimensional probe, a three-dimensional picture, which you can call tomography, of the universe across various exciting epochs of its evolution, some of which we saw in a few talks like the talk. You have the epoch of reionization. You have some things called the dark ages. And you have basically things which are not accessible to you in the visible being, being accessible in 21 centimeter cosmology. At some level, it's also a bit like slicing Swiss cheese. You know, you have the different parts of the universe doing different things, and you have bubbles and ionization zones overlapping, things like that. And as you slice in frequency, you're actually observing the universe evolving across redshifts, right? So in the post-reionization phase of the universe, which is basically where Thiet left off between redshift 6 and redshift 0, as we know, the universe is highly ionized. And there's a very exciting technique to probe neutral hydrogen at these epochs, which is known as intensity mapping. So like the name suggests, in one sentence, the definition of intensity mapping can be said as, you want to make a map of the integrated 21 centimeter emission without the resolution of individual galaxies. So that makes it faster and more effective. And also, it is able to constrain neutral hydrogen density parameter, which is very similar to the omega matter. So you have omega of neutral hydrogen and its clustering, both the things. And this has actually been tried. I mean, so it's been tried around redshift of redshift about one, just at one redshift, which they did with some auto and cross correlation. This is the Green Bank Telescope, and they have these kind of maps. So it's very similar to the CMB, which is one surface. So you have the Rayleigh limit when intensity can be mapped to brightness temperature. So you can constrain the fluctuations of this 21 centimeter background, and possibly in the future constrain cosmology. So needless to say, there are a lot of efforts to map out the distribution and evolution of neutral hydrogen across both the reionization as well as the post-reionization phases of the universe. We have the GMRT operated by NCRA just across the road. And we have something called the LOFAR in Netherlands, which again, Thiet alluded to. We just put out some results. You have paper, Meerkat. This is in Brazil. This is Canada, China. And of course, the distant dream is the square kilometer array, which probably is in South Africa and Australia coming up. What I've been told is that many of these artist impressions, which I'm showing here, are soon becoming, or some have actually become, a, become photographs. right? So in the light of all these experiments and this data, it's very important to have a framework which will allow you to make predictions for the post-reionization neutral hydrogen observations. 
and especially at all scales including nonlinear scales. So H1 is something which allows you to probe so many scales, especially nonlinear scales and not just the large scales. So it's very important to have an analytical framework or a simple framework which will allow you to understand this across the post reionization universe. The halo model which has been used extremely successfully for describing both dark matter as well as galaxy evolution seems ideally suited for this purpose. So in the, for this audience, I will just give a very brief one slide review of the HALO model. Of course, much more detail is, is available in the seminal review. As we all know, it's a very powerful tool in cosmology to constrain nonlinear, discuss nonlinear gravitational clustering. It basically has three ingredients. You have the HALO mass function, which tells you how the HALOs are distributed across cosmic time. It tells you about the halo bias, which, which basically is a measure of how these halos are clustered, and the halo profile, which tells you in a, for a given mass halo, how the mass is distributed in the halo as a function of scale. This halo model has been widely used to describe, as I said, the abundance and clustering of dark matter. And not only that, you also have halo occupation distributions on this model to describe galaxy evolution, and that has been done very successfully. So the natural question to ask at this stage is, therefore, can we develop and constrain a halo model framework for the distribution of neutral hydrogen in the post reionization universe? And importantly, can we constrain the parameters using the wealth of observational data we already have today, right? So to do this, it makes sense to take one step back and survey the amount of data we have in neutral hydrogen in the post reionization universe. Here's the plot showing the post reionization universe in redshift. And the kind of probes we have for neutral hydrogen can be broadly divided. What, what I'll be doing in this talk is broadly divided into these three classes. One of them is the 21 centimeter emission. This is basically something, this is a very conservative limit. Most, of, most people would say it's more like 0.2 or 0.3 where H1 21 centimeter emission has been statistically done. What you do here is to just have a resolved H1 galaxies in 21 centimeter at low redshifts. Because of current radio facilities, we cannot at the, at the present moment extend this to higher redshifts. We would need probably SKA or things like that. Here is the measurement which I alluded to in one of the previous slides. You have the intensity mapping, wherein you just make a map of the 21 centimeter emission. Again, both of these are emission, and it's, in, it's without the resolution of galaxies. On the other part of this redshift range, from about 1.5 to 5.5, you have the same or similar sort of H1 systems, these dense systems which give rise to these things at the low redshifts appearing in a completely complementary probe, which is known as a damped Lyman alpha H1 absorption. So these systems basically show up in the Lyman alpha DLA. So basically, you have DLA, the Lyman alpha line going into optical around these, these redshifts. And you, you can measure their column densities and do statistics with these systems. And so basically, these are the observations in each of these. So you have what is known as the mass function of H1 systems in the 21 centimeter emission. You can get their column density as well as you can get their clustering. And with this intensity mapping, you can, this has been done with GBT deep 2. You can get a constraint on the integrated omega and B. And for the DLA systems, as I said, you have a lot of surveys which gets you very detailed constraints on the column density, on the bias, the clustering, and something called the incidence of these systems. Right. So in order to use all these observations into a halo model framework, you need to basically do this. You need to paint neutral hydrogen on the already existing dark matter halo model, right? And this is kind of like a schematic. You have a dark matter halo, and inside you probably have a H1 galaxy. And you want to ask, given the underlying dark matter halo model, what do you need? It turns out that you basically need two H1 ingredients to convert the dark matter halo model into an H1 halo model. The first one is known as the MH1 of MZ, which is, an, which is a measure of, on the average, how much H1 mass will you associate to a halo of mass M at redshift Z. And the second one is just basically tells you how you will distribute that H1 inside the halo of mass M at redshift Z as a function of R. 
So it can be shown and we have shown this basically that if you have these two then you can basically derive all the observations which we have for the DLA systems as well as for the 21 centimeter emission and intensity mapping experiments. So in the next two slides I will just describe the, the two components the H1 halo mass relation and the H1 profile in some more details. So when we model the H1 halo mass relation we use this particular form which is basically a subset, a superset of various forms which have been tried in the literature by different authors and it has three ingredients. The first one is called alpha which tells you the no, overall normalization of H1 in this particular halo relative to cosmic fraction. So this, this is FHC is the cosmic fraction and alpha is just an up down normalization parameter which changes that. The second one is something called beta and this whole thing describes what is known as a slope which will turn out to be in important in the coming slides. What this tells you is if you don't want an MH1 to be strictly proportional to M but you want it to have a slope, you need to introduce this, this beta. The third one is again very physical quantity which is something which tells you how which, what kind of halo masses preferentially will you stop hosting H1 at. And it makes sense to have a virial velocity cutoff for this rather than a mass cutoff because of several simulations and analysis and you can also use a mass cutoff. So like I said this is like a superset of various forms people have tried in the literature and this introduces for you these three free parameters into the problem. For the radial profile most of the analysis have favored uh, the fact that H1 probably is sitting in exponential disks. So we find that using a radial exponential probably is a sensible thing to do for at least at low redshifts and the, for that you need to normalize it somewhere so you need a virial radius scale radius relation which introduces for you a concentration parameter and once you have a concentration parameter you need to ask how it evolves with redshift. So that it, again this is a form which is widely used for dark matter and as well as for H1 in several papers and that introduces for you these two free parameters into the problem. So together with those three and these two you have five free parameters and for historical reasons so since various people had advocated that actually an altered NFW profile that is an NFW profile with a thermal core seems to be actually favored for various of the simulations of uh, gas in halos. We considered this profile, we also had considered it in previous studies. So this is one of the other profiles you can consider but it does turn out later that exponential seems to be better preferred than an altered NFW. So in these, the next two slides I will just tell you how with the profile as well as the MH1 of M you can derive all the observations which we can, we have constraints on in the post realization universe. So in order to do the damped Lyman alpha observations you draw a line of sight and you constrain the column density like this and then you can define a particular cross section when the object can, will become a DLA, will be seen as a DLA and then you can go ahead and compute statistical quantities like the incidence, the column density distribution and the clustering of these systems from, from essentially the profile and the MH1. You can also do the nonlinear clustering, so this is important since I mentioned that we want to go to nonlinear scales and constrain the observations. So basically you have the H1 profile and then you can take a Fourier transform and get this, this object and just as you do for the dark matter you can get the 1 and 2 halo terms and take one more Fourier transform to get the mass weighted correlation function of these systems. And once you do that you can have it as a function of scale and since observations will finally constrain the function of scale you can, you can use this to match the data. So having this, this whole, this, all this theory as well as the observational data, the DLA as well as the 21 centimeter, uh, centimeter experiments, we can go ahead and constrain the parameters using a Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo approach and the spirit we adopted in this whole work was that since you have 21 centimeter as well as DLA which are completely different observations but they are probing the same or similar kind of systems, H1 is H1 is H1 across redshifts so all these observations to come together in a natural evolutionary scenario. So you have these kind of constraints on the five free parameters which you obtain and you you find that you can fit the data reasonably well. So at low redshifts like I said you have the 21 centimeter base measurements. So this is one of the surveys which constrains the mass function and this is another survey which constrains the column density distribution, the WISP 
And there is also the clustering as a function of scale from the alpha alpha survey. And you can match them reasonably well by using the halo model best fit parameters. At intermediate redshifts, you have the intensity mapping measurement, the GBT measurement, as well as you have a measurement of the DLA system selected in MG2 by Rao et al. 2006. And both these are completely independent, but we find that we can batch both of them reasonably well with the same HALO model. At higher redshifts, like I said, you have the SDSS and UVS, UVS surveys and other surveys, which Gemini GMOS, it's called GGG. And these surveys constrain the column density distribution of these high density systems. Again, you find that you get reasonable, reasonably good matches to the data. And so the best fitting HALO model, which is, which is preferred by the Markov chain Monte Carlo, is basically one in which you have MH1 of M going like this and the profile going like this. And just last week, I was talking to one of the simulation people who found that their simulations also get very similar results for the evolution. So it seems to be well constrained. And so what you find, one of the highlights of this is that, like I told you, you, you have a lot of evidence for a non-unity slope. So basically, this is a unity slope of the MH1 of M. So the beta parameter is quite important. And I'll have a little bit more to say in the next slide about the beta. Another thing is, as you can see, an exponential profile seems to work very well, definitely works very well at low redshifts, and it's as reasonable as the altered NFW at high redshift as well. The other thing about this MH1 of M relation is that at the lower redshifts where we actually have data of the mass function before the SKA, we, we do have data from experiments now, we can do a direct abundance match and, const and constrain the MH1 of M relation and we find that you get something very close to what you get in the forward model. And it also has consequences for stellar and cold gas relations, which I'll come to in a minute. So a few things which I would like to highlight about the insights which I learn or which we learn from the modeling right from the Bayesian MCMC, we find that we can actually learn something physical about cold gas and stellar evolution. So the first thing is that in the literature, historically, there have been many H1 halo mass relations adopted. And one of them is by Jasjeet Bagla et al. in 2010, before a particular damped Lyman alpha measurement. And after that measurement happened, uh, lots of models by Barnes and Martin Henault. And we ourselves tried several models as well for the H1 halo mass relation. And you can see that they are widely different. So the 21 centimeter analytical models and the damped Lyman alpha analytical models were quite different, as you can see, from the H1 halo mass relation. And we did a study where we tried to combine them in one evolutionary scenario, just, just as face value, taking both these models and doing a combination. But both these models had the MH1 proportional to M at these high masses. And therefore, what you found is that this kind of modeling will, will actually do reasonably well, but it doesn't really do well when it comes to the H1 mass function. You, you overpredict a lot at these high masses. And therefore, what we found when we did the MCMC was that you really need a non-unity slope of the H1 halo mass relation. And the reason you are needing this is in order to fit the mass function better, right? So therefore, fitting the mass function required a non-unity slope. So this was, the, this was the physics which was going into this beta being non-unity. And another thing we found, which I alluded to, is that if you have an exponential profile rather than an altered NFW, so you have an altered NFW, which are these orange or yellow curves, and you find that even with the best MCMC, the best parameters, you still had a little bit of tension between these two. Right? And when you had a little bit of tension between these two, you, you, I, we tried resolving them by including systematics and things like that, which was not very satisfactory. But the minute we used an exponential profile, you can see the red. This tension resolved almost beautifully. I mean, it's co not completely resolved yet, but it, you can see that it does a much better job at these very, very, very small error bar observations. Right. So an ex exponential profile did help to reduce the previously observed tension between the H1 halo mass relation and the column density at redshift zero. Another thing which we did, which we tried such that we could be complementary to this, as well as some of the, uh, some of the analogs to the, what has been done very successfully for galaxy and stellar evolution, is to do abundance matching. 
So what you do here is to say that we have constraints on the H1 mass function from observations and we want an empirical way of getting at the H1 halo mass relation. So since we already know the dark or we think we know the dark matter mass function, we can evidence match both of them and get the MH1 of M from that. And you see that this will look very similar to what we get in forward modeling. That just tells us the approaches are consistent because unless something very nonlinear is happening, you expect the same from forward and backward approaches, right? So it's monotonic. You can constrain cold gas fractions and you can compare them to stellar cold gas to stellar halo mass relations. And this and this together allows you to put constraints on two things, both of which are directly observable. H1, stellar mass relations, right? At redshift zero, this is what you get from the abundance matching uh, uh, combined with what is already known for stellar mass halo mass relations. And you see that although the data have a lot of scatter, it's reasonably matching the trends in the data, right? And another thing this is consistent with is that there are lots of observations of low redshift systems and H1 surface density profiles. Prominent among these are the Big Yale and Blitz relation, which actually predicts for you the the sigma h1, the surface density is a function of scale. And what you find is the model out of the box, the MCMC match model, even though it was not matched to this data, actually fits this pretty well. And this was nice to see that we fit it very well because we have the parameters which are calibrated to a completely different set of observations. Another thing which it fits well is a very famous very famous result that there is an impact parameter column density anti-correlation. So we have that in our model as well. It does work. And there is also data on impact parameter covering fractions of DLA. So you have, there's not much, but you have some data points here. And for a reasonable range of halo masses, the model predictions very well match the data, right? So now that I have told you about how we can develop and constrain the halo model and what insights it gives us and other observations that it is consistent with, let me quickly summarize in one slide. So as I said, we've built a halo model framework for cosmological neutral hydrogen. There are two important ingredients in this framework, the H1 halo mass relation and the H1 profile. It's constrained well by the wealth of data we already have, which is a combination of the 21 centimeter emission line experiments, intensity experiments, and the high redshift jammed lime and alpha absorption uh, experiments. And the best fitting H1 halo mass relation and profile can be obtained by a Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis. And the model predictions are consistent with the data which we match to, but are also consistent with abundance matching and stellar cold gas relations low redshift observations for H1 surface density and DLA covering fraction observations. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Right, so we match it with the alpha alpha. I know this is a number weighted measurement and we have a mass weighted measurement. But we match this with this mass weighted, with the, there is a paper by Pastergis et al, which does this number weighted in different mass bins. And you find that there's not much mass dependence. And so we found it a good approximation to use the mass weighted measurement here. And we find, and this is what you use in the MCMC, yes. Okay, so but the uh, large scale stuff, if you yeah. see around uh, like yes. one, two, three, that is not Exactly well, it, there is a tension there, but again, I have not put an error on the model here. And so, the, and also since we are, we have actually subsampled the data in order to take into account the correlation between the parameters, it's probably not, you know, the, this is the only measurement we have. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah the the slide, the third from the last. Okay. I think when you compared it, a slope. This one? No, keep going. Keep, mm -hmm. Where you compared your result to the big L slope, you had two slopes. Uh, uh, that, that one, no. And you this said, one, that yes. One, that one in the left panel. Yes. And you said that this fits. Well. And whenever I see two lines, I don't know whether they're fit or not if they don't have any air bars. Sure, absolutely. No, no this, is just, this, is just, uh, this is just qualitatively showing you that, you know, what we get, what we actually get is with the error bars, both of them are significant, uh, are within, you know, they're each other's error bars. And it was just incredible that something which was completely not matched to the data matched the, matched the observations uh, uh, very well. So, but if the error bars are very narrow, it no, doesn't No, they're match not. At all. Well, okay, so error bars. <laughs>
stars are almost this high. So there's, yeah. 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 Um, sorry. Um, when we were doing um, CMV work, of course, and had the um, Lander CDM model, yes. and also knowing that we were really well into the linear regime, yes. um, it was possible to, for the theorists to come up with a very you know, firm prediction yes. of the sort of level of fluctuations yes. they expected to yes. see. Yes, yes. Um, how well can we do for, for, I'm thinking of H1 intensity mapping. Yes. Um, can we put really firm limits on where we will absolutely have to see something and how far above that are the sort of best results like okay. paper? So we did one analysis where we actually looked at all the astrophysical constraints on what the stuff that goes into the H1 power spectrum, pH1. And we found that, unfortunately, the astrophysical constraints right now are at, the, at a level where, you know, you will expect 60 to 100 percent uncertainty in them itself. So unless the astrophysics, I mean, in the astrophysics in omega H1 and BH1, we have tighter constraints, I don't think we can make cosmological predictions. Uh, it might have to wait till the SKA to, you know, to do that because I've been looking at some of the initial forecasts and things like that. You do have a lot of astrophysics to take care of and we're hoping that a model like this matched to better data in the future for sure will take care of this and hopefully constrain cosmology. Yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank Hamsa and all the... Also, all the speakers who have spoken this morning, we, we convene after lunch at 2.15. Thank you. 2.15.